Hello, Professor, and um, thank you. Welcome to the podcast, and thank you for joining me. Um, if you could uh, tell a little bit about your background and your area of expertise. Sure. Um, so I work on understanding human language. I'm sorry, my dog is trying to come in. I'll be right That's back. fine. Come on, pup. So I work on human language, and um, uh, I, I guess I've always been interested in language and languages. I was learning several languages when I was a child, um, and then in college I learned that there is a field that specializes in studying um, how people produce and understand language and um, human cognition more broadly, and so I decided that that's definitely what I want to do. Um, and so then I went to um, graduate school um, at MIT to mm -hmm. uh, learn more about human cognitive science, cognitive neuroscience. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then I postdoced for a few years. Um, and then I had a faculty position at Harvard Medical School. And then in uh, 2019, I moved to uh, MIT full time as faculty member. And so, yeah, <laughs> I don't know what level of detail you want. So uh, um, why why you were attracted uh, to the language specifically as a neuroscientist? Um, well, um, I mean, language is a kind of hallmark cognitive ability of humans. I mean, of course, all animals, um, uh, even very simple organisms communicate in some ways but humans have this incredible capacity to translate any abstract and complex thought into a string of words, mm -hmm. uh, which is quite um, a remarkable feat. Um, and um, yeah, and it seemed <laughs> pretty uh, important to try to understand how that could be implemented. I mean, I'm driven by, I'm a basic researcher, meaning that uh, um, I'm driven primarily by questions in basic science, how do things work? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, um, trying to reverse engineer the mind and brain. Um, and of course, the hope is that eventually it will have clinical applications and maybe applications in education as well. Uh, but um, at the heart, like the reason that I, you know, do what I do is because I'm curious about how our minds are uh, structured and organized. And yeah. So since you, since you mentioned it, so um, what is... Uh how does the language interact and affect the way our mind and brain work? Um, so, so I think you may be asking about the relationship between language and the rest of and the, the re and the rest of the and yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's true that our brains and our minds do a lot of things, right? We see things, we perceive things through different senses. Um, we have very sophisticated motor control. Um, we can do things like arithmetic, we can understand music, right? So there's a lot of things that we can right. do. And one of the big questions um, uh, that has guided a lot of the early work, um, as well as my own work, uh, is um, how is this all structured? Um, and the two extremes are basically that there is um, a very high degree of specialization, so that the brain and mind are composed of little specific mechanisms, mm -hmm. each of which is specialized for a particular cognitive function. So an analogy that was used by my former mentor, Nancy Kamwasher, is um, of a Swiss army knife, right, where a Swiss army knife has a lot of attachments and each of them has right. a very particular function. Um, and the other extreme is that the brain is kind of a pretty homogeneous um, set of mechanisms where each part, like each, anywhere mm -hmm. you look, you find multifunctionality so that any bit of um, any chunk of cells, any circuit, any brain region will do um, a whole bunch of different things. Um, and the truth seems to be much closer to the first story, um, that there is a lot of structure um, in the brain. Um, it's a little bit different from some of the early proposals where people were trying to think of the brain as made up of kind of distinct patches of with different functions. It seems like the patches that can be sometimes pretty far away in the brain are deeply... Ollie, stop. I'm sorry. I'll show <laughs> you. This is, this is the creature that makes... Oh, nice. Um, 
anyways, so, so um, um, so sometimes the patches that um, uh, can be pretty far away are deeply interconnected. And so the current kind of state of the art understanding of the brain is that it's made up of these so-called large scale networks. Mm -hmm. So there is definitely separation among different parts, but it's not in the form of little patches, but rather a whole set of interconnected areas. And for example, one network may support high level visual processing, one network may support um, motor control or general executive functions, um, and another network may support language comprehension. And so the network that supports language comprehension is what um, I've showed Node, um, is highly separate from, from um, other aspects of higher level cognition. So when I came into the field, the kind of um, standard understanding was that language overlaps with all sorts of things from general working memory to music perception to arithmetic um, and that just turns out not to be the case mm -hmm. um, if you use rigorous methods um, and do the right kinds of experiments you find that um, brain regions that are highly active when we process language are actually completely silent when you do all sorts of other things sometimes you have nearby regions that respond to say arithmetic or music perception but they're totally distinct so Which has implications. yeah okay so so uh then uh, let's let's talk about the um brain regions responsible specifically for language what is the yeah. functional difference between them um you mean between the different language regions yes or between those regions and other that parts no the, the the regions that responsible specifically for language yeah, so, so it's um that's a very hard question. I mean, so we know that there is um so when I talk about language, I'm generally referring to um high level processes, meaning mm -hmm. kind of once you um get to the level of words and above, right? So in comprehension it's recognizing words and putting them together into phrases and sentences, and in production it's retrieving the right kinds of um stored words and constructions and composing right. a, an out of them so we know that that um, those mechanisms are separate from lower level perceptual mechanisms so for example in our auditory cortex we have um, a patch um, of cortex that responds highly selective to speech sounds mm -hmm. but it doesn't care at all about meaning so it will respond just as strongly when you listen to some language that's totally unfamiliar to you as it does to a language you understand. Right. Um, but it doesn't respond to things like, again, like music or you know telephone ringing or dog barking. So it's highly selective to the acoustics of speech. And that's separate. That's highly separable from the high level interpretation and production regions. And then similarly, in the um, motor cortex, we have um, some parts of it that respond to producing speech sounds. So that's mm -hmm. now kind of low level execution, right? So once you have prepared an right. utterance, you send it down to your motor system. And oftentimes we speak things. Um, people who are literate can also type it or write it by hand. Uh, but that's kind of, you know, low level execution. And that's again, highly separate from the high level language regions, which we think effectively store our knowledge of the language, store a set of mappings between the forms, um, like mm -hmm. words and constructions, and the meanings that they correspond to in the world. Um, and we effectively use that store in um, different directions in comprehension right. and production. But in comprehension, I'm trying to map incoming things onto those stored representation and interpret the signal. And in production, I'm searching through that store to try to come up with a way to express an idea I have. Okay. Okay, so in your uh, 2015 presentation, How Language Evolved, you said that the language is a useful code for our thoughts. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you please elaborate on this? And um, uh, the, the follow-up question, so are there ways, since it's a kind of a code, are there ways to improve the efficiency in which one learns a second language, second, third, fourth, doesn't matter, or it, if it matters? actually, and perhaps yes. by decoding the language and focusing on certain areas more than others? Yeah, you ask good questions. <laughs> um, Thank so, you. <laughs> well, <laughs> so the first question is about um, language and thought relationship, right? Yes. So the key, um, the key thing there is that language is very separate from thought. It's not thought. And um, uh, evidence from uh, individuals with severe language impairments 
um, suggests that we can lose um, a lot of our ability to communicate mm -hmm. linguistically and yet preserve our ability to do all sorts of sophisticated things, okay. including things that are kind of human specific, like do sophisticated math or, um, you know, extract structure from music or think about other people's mental states, which is another sophisticated thing we can do. Um, and I'm just going to let my dog out again. Okay, Pop, it's your last chance. You can't come back in. Um, and so, um, like I said at the beginning, right? So one thing that humans do that any other animals, no other animal can do to the best of our understanding is um, we can take any abstract thought, no matter how complex and sophisticated, and we can find a way to describe it mm -hmm. in words. And that gives us the ability to talk to each other, right? So a lot of All animals right. have some pretty sophisticated cognitive abilities, but they can't sit down and talk about it. And being able to talk about your thoughts it's a very powerful capacity because it allows for potentially really sophisticated cooperation and collaboration, which we think uh, mm -hmm. maybe was important in the evolution of our species, right? We could um, um, strategize, we could teach each other about uh, innovations we've come up with, like making better tools. Um, uh, we can keep track of, uh, we can share information about other conspecifics, like, you know, trust that guy and don't trust that guy, he'll steal your stuff. Um, so having the ability to talk about anything that's in our mental state is mm -hmm. an incredibly powerful capacity. And so that's what I mean by the fact that it's a code, because um, in a lot of people's thinking, both scientists and um, non-scientists, they sometimes conflate language and so on, and they kind of think it's all the same thing. But it's really not. And we know that they're separable from, mm -hmm. you know, animal studies, from studies of these individuals with severe language impairments. Um, it's not to say that language cannot be important developmentally. So there is some evidence that um, having access to language is really important for certain capacities to evolve okay. into the state that they exist in the adult brain. But it's all... Um, somewhat um, controversial and hard to study because, of course, we can't experimentally deprive children of linguistic input. So we only have glimpses of evidence into those questions. Um, so that's on the code code um, for thought um, issue. Regarding the question of what makes you, um, like what makes it easier or harder to learn other languages. I mean, so, so effectively when you're learning a second or third, whatever language you're learning, another set of mappings, mm -hmm. right, between the world and some set of phonological um, representations, sound representations. And a key difference between learning your native language and learning a language in adulthood is that when you're learning your first language, you're simultaneously acquiring the forms and a lot of the conceptual structure about the world. You're learning about how the world works. Right. Uh, and how much of that may be may have some built-in biases is highly debated but so that's that's really, that's a native language right yes yes, yes okay exactly. mm -hmm. um so kids are learning all sorts of facts about the world while at the same time learning to talk about the world right when you're learning the second language all of the conceptual stuff is there right like that is um set in stone um in the brain and um uh you're now learning to map a new set of representations onto those stored conceptual ones that's um, cool yeah this makes it's sense cool. yeah it makes sense so it is um, cool <laughs> and it's um and it's um it's highly variable across people as to how easy it is to do right. and um i don't work on those questions there's a few labs who specifically study second language acquisition the only little bit of relevant work we've done is looking at um polyglots so these okay. are individuals who are um uh typically in their pretty mature years, so not as kids, um, learn a whole bunch of languages. So in our set, we've had people, you know, from kind of a more normal range, like five languages to something like 60 languages, which is just crazy, right? Like to any normal person right. like to know. Or, and of course, they don't know all the languages perfectly. Uh, they, they know some languages really well. And then there's kind of a tale of um, other languages that they can communicate a little bit in, but not perfectly and so on and so forth. And so we wanted to ask whether something is different about how they process languages. And um, there's basically, so to compare them to uh, non-polyglots, you can only look at um, uh, native language processing, right? Because um, 
you can't, you know, any typical individual will only speak one language or maybe a couple languages to mm -hmm. three languages. But um, to, to make a comparable case, we looked at the processing of native language. So say an American polyglot who speaks 30 languages and an American non-polyglot who speaks, you know, one or two languages. Um, and we found that when they process native language, the um, neural resources they use are much um, less extensive. So they activate the very same system. Of course, you wouldn't expect this to be totally different, right. but the um, activations are basically much more uh, confined to smaller areas uh, compared to in non-polyglot individuals. Um, and it's hard to know whether um, this is um, the result of them having learned other languages and become more efficient at being able to use less of your brain to process your native language, or whether there was some initial difference in their more efficient processing that drove them um, to learn more lang right. languages. Uh, to, do, to answer that question, you would have to do some kind of longitudinal study where you track the brain responses as somebody learns more and more languages. But um, we kind of think it's more likely experientially driven, um, and it seems a little bit reminiscent of um, what we see in we as a um, as a field see in, for example, motor learning. Like if I teach you a new complicated motor task, mm -hmm. um, you will initially activate a very broad swath of your motor cortex, and then as you become more and more efficient with practice, the activations kind of shrink. Mm -hmm. suggesting that you now can only use a small fraction of your motor cortex to do the same sophisticated things. So basically more... the same thing when, when they learn uh, uh, more languages. Exactly, exactly. That's what uh -huh. we think is happening. But in terms of um, like second language learning and um, how to make things um, more efficient and which things to focus on, I don't think the field has clear answers. Um, but I'm also not exactly in that area, so I may not know about some of the latest things. But it's um, it's a it's a tricky question to ask and answer, uh, in part because it's yeah, there's um, all sorts of methodological, non-trivial decisions to make in how to study this. Like, do you want to take um, a bunch of people and um, uh, teach them from scratch, right, and all then right. track? learn a language do you want to take existing learners and there you usually deal with all sorts of variability that exists in people's backgrounds and people's cognitive abilities and so it's a challenging it's a challenging um um area but um you know people are making progress i can give you some pointers to people who work on those particular questions um but um yeah okay. but i don't know if i have more to say about that so um uh did you refer the when you mentioned that um, you studied uh, polyglots? Uh, is there could you share with the listeners? Is this a Alice's uh, Adventures in Wonderland experiment that you conducted? Not or quite. Not, I mean, not quite. So, okay. so they're they're um they're a little bit merging right now. So basically, we when we started the polyglot project. In addition to the thing that I mentioned, where we compare native language processing between mm -hmm. polyglots and non-polyglots, we also wanted to see how different languages within a polyglot are processed, right? And so to do that, we wanted to scan people in the different languages that they're familiar with, and we needed materials um, in different custom sets of languages right. for each individual. And we were wondering, you know, what to turn to. It's like non-trivial to create materials. And, you know, <laughs> across all the polyglots we've tested, I think we cover like, you know, 120 languages or something. And so it's, it's a challenging thing to do. And so at the time we turned to an existing resource, which is um, the Bible corpus, um, which is basically um, uh, missionaries who have translated Bible stories to different languages as part of trying to convert people to Christianity. And mm -hmm. that's a publicly available source. And so we initially use materials from that, um, but um, uh, it's, you know, well, people may vary on this. I don't find those stories particularly enticing and they're right. also quite repetitive. Um, and so over time, we also wanted to study a broad range of languages, um, not with respect to polyglots, just trying to ask, you know, is something different about Chinese people processing Chinese than English speakers processing mm -hmm. English because language is different in all sorts of ways. And so we ourselves started collecting a corpus of um, recordings of um, Alice in Wonderland, which is one of the most translated um, books. And so we're now, I think, at like 50 languages and we're just about to submit the first paper. For now, just characterizing the basic similarities across people mm -hmm. of different languages, processing different languages. Um, but now that we establish kind of this common 
foundation, we're going to try to dive more deeply and try to systematically look at how different languages may be processed differently. Because um, as a native speaker of Russian, you will know, for example, that languages like Russian don't much care about word order, right? right? Whereas languages like English have very, very rigid word orders. And those are two, and so the way that um, Russian solves the problem of conveying information of who is doing what to whom is through mm. rich morphological markings, right? So you have to have an ending on a noun that right. has a particular gender, particular case, and then it has to agree with another element and so on. And so these are two very different strategies for solving kind of how to convey complex meanings, right? You can fix the order and say, okay, the first thing is just always the one who is doing the action mm -hmm. or something like that. Or you can say, ignore order, and I'll just tell you from the little endings and the words who is doing the action, and you can switch them around in whichever way, right? And so the question, one one interesting question is whether people who speak languages like Russian and people who speak English like languages like English have some differences in how their language system operates. Nobody has asked questions like that before, and so um, now that we have the tools to do this, we'll hopefully once um, a pandemic um, quiets down and we can resume data collection, we can maybe start looking at some questions along those lines. Were, were you able to conduct any research while uh, this in this crazy times now? No, no, we stopped. So we stopped mm -hmm. right in early March. We stopped all data collection. We've been focusing on um, analyzing the large amounts of data we have and mm -hmm. uh, writing papers, which um, has been OK. But for a lot of younger labs, I think it's been really challenging because um, you know, data collection is a pretty critical part of um, doing science. And so, um, yeah, it's um, interesting times we live in. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, in um, what does uh, what role does memory play in the learning a new language, if if any? So that's a very good question. So you also, I mean, so there's also different kinds of memory, right? So mm -hmm. there's kind of long term memory that just how well you remember information right. over time, and then there's this kind of working memory, which is how much information you can actively keep in mind and process at the same time. Uh, both of those are likely important. Um, one thing I learned, even though I wasn't asking this question, but one thing I learned um, when working with polyglots is that it seems like there is, um, and probably any foreign language teacher will already know this just through experience of working with, people seem to have, um, to be very different at what they find easy and hard when learning a language. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, some people remember words really well. They may not be able to use grammar right in all, all times and whatever, and they may have a really bad accent, but they just, you know, once they hear a meaning of a word, they'll remember it. Other people are really good imitators, so they may have trouble remembering things, but you can say some something in a foreign language to them and they'll repeat it identically. It will sound just the same. Um, yet other people are really good at structure, so they can figure out how to put things grammatically in the right way, but they may not always know the right words. And so there's this large heterogeneity in which things people find um, easy and hard. And so memory is certainly a big part of it. Um, we do need to remember a new set of words when we're learning a language mm -hmm. um, um, and suppress the irrelevant meanings um, efficiently to access the right ones. Um, and working memory certainly um, plays a role in language um, in some way, just because, um, you know, when you're, well, both in production and comprehension, but say, say in comprehension, as um, the information is unfolding, you have to keep track of what you just processed and focus mm -hmm. on the current one and integrate it, right? So there's a lot of kind of online demands that you're engaged in. Um, but um, beyond this kind of very general level of description, um, it's, uh, there's still a lot we don't understand, like, for example, to the extent that people systematically differ in these capacities, both long-term memory or the working memory, whether that makes them better mm -hmm. um, at learning um, new information, including languages. Uh, a lot of that literature is controversial because um, um, when you start looking at, so a lot of this work has been done on comparing um, bilinguals and monolinguals. And there were some early um, studies suggesting that bilinguals have general executive advantages. So people who um, speak multiple languages are better at um, just kind of um, focusing on the most task relevant, goal relevant uh, bits and suppressing irrelevant ones. Um, that was 
proposed sometime in the 90s. And then since then, people basically have not been able to find that robustly across populations. But some people now say that maybe this is because the bilingual populations that have been studied are all really very different. And you only find it in some cases, but not others. Maybe you only find it in cases where you have to actively switch back and forth between languages all the time but maybe not in cases like you know like i consider myself uh, pretty bilingual um at this point but like i hardly ever speak russian so i don't have mm -hmm. that demand of having to suppress russians kind of suppress long term right. if you will um and so i think a lot of work remains to be done to understand both um how these potential differences in memory capacity affect um the learning and processing of languages there's interesting things to do there. Uh, uh, do you apply or, or incorporate any techniques or concepts you learn from your research in your your routine or maybe with your kids or something? <laughs> um, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, uh, any recommendations, though? <laughs> purpose, yeah. I mean, it's certainly... Look, I mean, so, so even um, even though a lot of the research about uh, bilingualism, multilingualism is controversial about like whether it makes your brain generally better. And mm -hmm. there's also claims not just that it helps you um, kind of as a mature, healthy brain, but there's some claims that it helps uh, delay dementia, for example, in old age. Right. But even even and there's also claims that it makes you a better um, um, kind of social agent in that if you are constantly keeping track like if say you have a bilingual household right say your mom speaks right. um english and your dad speaks russian um and as a kid growing up you have to always keep um keep in mind the fact that you know one of them may not know everything right. about the other language and so there is a claim out there that it trains up your kind of social empathizing capacity so being able to think That's about interesting. others thoughts. yeah and so but even if none of this is true just speaking multiple languages is a helpful thing to be able to do right i mean so first of all right now of course the you know there is um these kind of dominant languages that a lot of people in the world speak like um english and chinese and um hindi and spanish right i mean where mm -hmm. you kind of you know almost anywhere you many many parts of the world you travel you'll be able to <laughs> survive better but also you know you can have the perks like reading a lot of the great literature in the original which is um um you know can be fun um and just yeah knowing another language is a helpful thing i mean i think it's just kind of not really controversial even if it doesn't make you better um mm. at anything that, else it's just that, a helpful skill to have for sure for sure <laughs> and so and i'm not following that advice because i'm not teaching so i have a three-year-old and i should be teaching her russian and i'm just not because i just find it my husband doesn't speak any russian and so it's just um it's an effort you know you have to make a um concentrated effort to um um, to do that, to speak constantly, I, constantly, yes, right? Yes, yeah. yes. And so I, I'm going to try. I mean, I'm, I'm, I keep, I keep, um, keep telling myself that I should try. Um, uh, and yeah, hopefully, <laughs> eventually I'll do that. But um, it's been so far. She's very good at speaking English. <laughs> I, I would like to read a quote by um, by Tom Lablock from from your presentation, actually which i found sure. very powerful and um, he was an art critic of the independent who had passed from a brain tumor uh, That's right. correct me if, I, if i'm wrong so and uh, uh what he said that uh my language to describe things in the world is very small limited my thoughts when i look at the world are vast limitless and normal same as they ever were my experience of the world is not made less by lack of language, but essentially unchanged. Mm -hmm. With that in mind, what do you think about Elon Musk's claim that his company Neuralink is developing technologies that will enable people to transfer very complex concepts from person to person without using a single word? And almost like a file is being transferred and downloaded into the recipient. Any yeah, thoughts? I think, <laughs> I think that's pretty unlikely. I mean, you know, we, <laughs> he said um, he said five, five to ten years. Yeah, yeah. Well, good luck to him. But uh, you know, we we are um, like we're working with some of the best technologies available to be able to decode 
uh, people's mental states, which is what you need, which is a key prerequisite for translating it to, right. um, like, I mean, the key challenge is to get the concepts out of somebody's head. Like, transferring them to another head is really pretty easy. You can just, um, you know, tell them something. Like, I mean, it, it's, it's <laughs> that's kind of the reason. We, like, language is a shortcut for that, basically. But to, to extract mental representations from somebody's mind is non-trivial. I mean, we we had um we've done some work where um we train um a language model so these days deep learning which are basically connectionist networks um that have many many layers they've gotten really good at mm -hmm. some language tasks and so we've um we've done some work in the past and doing it um, more now where you can train a, a, a language network on some um, language corpus and then try to use the representations extracted from those networks to um, neural representations to try mm -hmm. to um, come up with a way to predict neural responses for any new word or uh, sentence. And, um, uh, you know, you can get something out um, under some pretty controlled um, circumstances. You can recover words, you can recover sentences. But um, this is all uh, kind of a very best case scenario where uh, in, in most, um, uh, this is in a situation where we present people with linguistic stimuli and mm -hmm. then uh, we try to decode the images that they form when processing those materials. But thought is not um, all verbal. And in fact, people argue as to how much uh, when you're thinking to yourself, some people have this percept of a little voice in their heads, right? They're kind of right. talking things. Other people say they don't know what that's about. And so they just think um, that the thought code is very likely more abstract than language. So there may be some parts of thought that kind of trickle down to the linguistic mm -hmm. encoding, but a lot of it is probably in, an, in a format that's highly abstract. And being able to read that out, um, I'm highly dubious that that will be possible in the next few years. I'm not saying it's never going to be possible, um, uh, but the kinds of data we can get from humans uh, to try to decipher the code that we use for thoughts are just not um, are just not all there, you know. We, because with, for example, with animals, um, we can do single cell recordings. We can mm -hmm. now record from large patches of animal cortex. We can um, stimulate and interfere with the activity of different areas um, uh, and um, in humans we're just much more limited so we can do intracranial recordings and we're doing some of that work um, we can even do single cell recordings but it's all very limited from very small parts of the i mean it's it's just not we just don't have the kind of data i would argue that would be needed to kind of to recover a full code of um, how our thoughts might be implemented in neural tissue but um you know, it's it's always good to have engineers on board, um, and so if they come up with some cool innovations, that's that's great. I mean, we work a lot with engineers um, as well in this work where we relate um, language models to brain data. Um, but uh, you kind of need um, neuroscientists and cognitive scientists as well to make sense of uh, things and to be able to guide engineering in the right way. But I don't know why you would want that also. <laughs> I mean, that's so like it's not very hard to talk. It's kind of enjoyable. Why would I want to communicate? The thing is, I, I believe his argument is that um, sometimes it's hard to convey um, pretty complex um, concepts or even uh, maybe even feelings or something. Uh, like a hundred percent in order to to avoid um, miscommunication or, or misunderstanding. Yeah. Yes. So this kind of, I think there is, a, I don't know, like a, I describe this uh, case and, the, and I transfer my thought and you're completely it's have the same yeah. understanding that I, I thought about this case or I gotcha, something. I gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think anybody would want that. Um, just think about it, right? Like we think a lot of um, not great things sometimes, right? right? <laughs> like you wouldn't want that to be readoutable by other people. Um, there's a lot of private thoughts that, um, you know, there's a reason why <laughs> right. we don't say everything that's in our minds, right? We have- No, I, I, I totally understand. It's not even even F, F, FDA thing. Yes, it's, exactly. It's a, it's a bunch of, bunch of things. Uh, 
privacy issues. Exactly. Um, yeah. Anyway, but we'll see how that goes. I guess <laughs> five years, I would say no chance, but I've been wrong before many times. So. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Evelina. Thank you for your time. And of um, and My if pleasure. there's anything uh, you would like to add, or and where can people find you and uh, follow your your research or your work? Yeah, well, I mean, we have um, a lab website. It's evlab.mit.edu, so we'll be there for the next bunch of years at least. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm happy for people to reach out with questions. I'm generally quite good on email. I don't know what um, your audience is exactly, but it's people who are interested in science, and I always try to help bring smart people, new smart people into science when we could always use fresh, bright brains. So um, yeah. Feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. Help. Of course. My Thank pleasure. you very much for your time. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Good talking.